If you want to learn how to make Ghibli style textures in Substance Painter, the latest course from the 3D coloring book was made for you. I'll leave a link in the description if you want to consider getting the course. Now let's get into this week's video. Hello everyone, my name is Rouge Olat, and today I'm going to do a little breakdown of this potion factory. First of all, I'm going to talk a little about composition and feedback. Then I will talk about the environment, like trim sheets I used, some procedural textures, and a few tips and tricks that I used a lot to make uh, assets more reusable. Then we will see overall how I made the vegetation of the scene. And finally, I'll show you how I made VFX and the importance they have in an environment to make it more dynamic. So the first thing I want to show you is the huge change the environment has had since I sent the first pass uh, screenshot asking for feedback till the final result. As you can see here, a lot of changes happen in between. The most noticeable one is how I push the lighting to create a more dramatic effect. Then another huge change is the separation between the foreground, the midground, and the background using occlusion and fog cards. Also, the god rays added to call the attention of the viewer to the to the points of interest, like the the tower, and finally break up the the fine shapes of the cap trees to make it more interesting. As you can see here, is they are really flat these two shapes, and here they are uh, way more interesting. So, in short, these are the points of interest of the environment. The main tower would be the, the main one. Then we would have this big tree with the signs and the side shop, and then the campfire. So this point of interest, I located, tried to respect the rule of third. So I don't place anything right in the middle and place as close as possible to the sweet spots, like this big tree and the signs, and then the campfire close to this one. Finally, just a little tip that uh, has been really useful to me is to try to break down the silhouettes, the flat silhouettes that you can get from trees and different things. So this purple line, for example, uh, shows you what would be a flat line and how break them with things like these kind of mushrooms, ferns, using moss also, here lianas and more moss. So they are more interesting to the to the viewer. Let's jump to Unreal Engine. First things first, I would like to show you the three trim sheets I use for wooden parts. The main benefits of using trim sheets are the acceleration when it comes to creating new probes. This is the first trim sheet with a lot of size variations to fit different wooden pieces shapes. The second one is way more homogeneous with uh, really similar sizes. And the third one has some hardwood to be able to create a full beam. In this last one, I plan to have more variations, but finally I haven't added them. That's why I have these gaps here and there. Let me show you how it looks in the environment. As you can see, I used it in many different places over the scene, so I saved time while getting a good looking result. Also, I used uh, it on these kind of wooden rings, I have also used it for this kind of platform with all these planks and also on this huge beam that holds the tower with those lianas and moss. So as you can see, I used it a lot through the thin. I also want to mention the procedural textures. I made this one in Substance Designer. So I created two variations, one with uh, painting on top and the other one without. So I could use vertex painting to create this effect that water or elements uh, have erased it from the roof tiles. This way I could use these textures on this rooftop and a variation of this one on this other roof, this other one and the top one. One of the most important things while using procedural textures and trim sheet, I would say, is to try not to make the patterns too visible. So, for example, in these roof tiles, uh, every tile looks uh, unique. For example, in my case, I use vertex painting to make the procedural texture 
look less repetitive so you can barely see the pattern okay so let's move on to another topic something really important in the environment creation process is to create as much variety as possible so any technique that helps doing this faster is a plus one thing that I use a lot is a small combination of Unreal Engine shader notes on the material that allows me to create small variations on the material base color. Let me show you this. For example, in the material trim sheet 03, the one that I'm using on those vims, I use these three notes on the base color. The first note, hue shift, is a material function that allows me to modify a little the hue of the base color texture. This second node, the saturation, let me play with the saturation of the of the texture. And this last node, power, let me play with the contrast of the of the base color. So by default I'll have a hue on zero, saturation on zero and contrast on one. So it uh, stays as it is the base color texture. And then with this material I create different instances so I can play with the parameters. So let me show you if I apply this new material instance to these two beams. For example, I can change the hue, so I can different I can get different colors uh, of the wood, which doesn't make a lot of sense with wood, but I could if I wanted to. Then I can play with the contrast. For example, if I want something with uh, a lot more contrast, I can increase this, and for example, decrease the saturation. So I can get something much older and dark wood, for example. For the saturation, to make it clear, since I'm using uh, this saturation node, as I increase this number, the saturation of the texture will decrease. And uh, if I decrease this number, the saturation will increase. On vegetation, I've also added a node that really helps to get a really good result, and it's pretty cheap to use. This is called the Speed Tree Color Variation node that basically allows you to add variation on the base color based on random values. So this node is pretty simple. You just need to add this at the end of your base color nodes. Just add the Speed Tree Color Variation node and add a scalar parameter to modify the seed that this node is using to create this variation. As much big as this parameter is, the more variation is going to have the material. So this way, if I go back to the level, I'll try to add a lot of foliage, for example, this one. Let's paint a lot of it, let's increase the size of the brush, paint a lot of it here. So if now I go to the material instance that this have and I increase the color variation, you're going to see how much the variation some flowers are getting from this node. This, for example, is really saturated. Uh, these ones are mm, basically white. So this way you can create with uh, one simple flower a lot of variation for your, for your uh, vegetation. Speed tree color variation node is made for trees, but you can use it wherever you need the color variation, as I did with flowers. I've also used this for trees and for bushes, for example. As you can see, once I have painted a few of them over the terrain, each of them have a subtle color variation and this helps a lot to create a more organic environment. So if I select one of them and I increase its size and I move it uh, through the environment, you can see these subtle changes uh, happening in real time. So once I place this in a position, it will stay with that variation. For the grass, I wanted to use a method I had never used before, using geometry-based grass, and I really liked the result. Some of the benefits of using geometry-based grass are that we don't need alpha maps, and it is really fast to make. Even more, if as base color, you use a runtime virtual texture, as I did. To make the grass, I used Maya, so I simply created three grass blade variations, and then used Mash to distribute them randomly and create grass patches. What I mean with that is that I created three versions of trees plus the two unique ones on both sides of the tower. Then I created three small branches that helped me a lot to make variation of those two trees. Let me show you. Here I have one of those two tree variations I just told you about. To create a different looking tree from this one, I add one or two branches that I created individually.
Once I have the desired result, I select all of them, right click, and select Convert Actor to Static Mesh. Then I just save it. And there we have another variation of that tree. To finish with the vegetation part, I want to mention something about landscape blending with vegetations using a runtime virtual texture and how it improves the appearance of a stuff like rocks. On these rocks, I also used an always on top mask to be able to add moss on it and increase the feeling that everything is merged with the landscape. Now, I want to talk a little about VFX. Even if you are an environment artist, you need to have in mind that VFX are one of the things that mostly increase the dynamism of your environments. VFX are things like wind and foliage. They may be subtle, but once you add them, all the environment looks much more alive. For the smoke that I have on the campfire and on the chimneys, I use basically the same technique. The idea I'm using is based on a video I saw almost a year ago on the YouTube channel CG How. First, you need the meshes that are going to act as the smoke particles. In my case, I'm using these kind of bubbles I made in Maya. The unique requirement to achieve the effect is setting the UVs like this. This way, you'll be able to use a simple texture to change between those meshes randomly. I'll show you in the material graph so you can understand what I'm talking about. I don't want to dive too deep into this, but it will be easier to learn if you see it directly. The base color part is pretty simple. This part is to create a fake shadow to make this effect under the particle mesh. This top part is to create a cell shading cartoon outliner that I finally didn't use. But still, this is the effect I created with this part. Here, on the right, I have the particle color set up. It allows me to change the particle color inside Niagara and also few parameters to play in the material instance. This part is where the magic happens. First, I'm using dynamic parameters, so I can adjust these parameters inside Niagara. This part here is the one I use to place on a position along the UV map, so depending on what part of the UV is placed, it will display one mesh or another, as I explained before. This last part is the vanishing effect of the particles. And finally, all this plugged in into the opacity mask. Now, let's move on to the Niagara system. Here, we just have to play with dynamic parameters and system attributes to get the desired result. For example, I use point force to point the direction of the smoke. Then, I also have the dynamic parameters where I set a random value to randomize the particle meshes. Then, I also combined other attributes such as vanishing tiling to modify the texture that erodes the particle. Use a color over time to make this gradient effect and rotate the mesh slightly while it is going up, so it looks less static. So, this would be pretty much everything I wanted to talk about BFX. In short, I would say that spending at least a little of the time needed to create an environment for BFX creation will improve this scene a lot. So, thank you all for watching this video. I really hope it has been interesting and helpful. If you have any questions or would like to know more about any other aspect of the environment, just let me know in my attestation or in the comment below. See you around, later!